This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Calgary Flames have done the impossible. After 25 straight losses dating all the way back to January 19th of 2004, the Calgary Flames won in the Honda Center and broken the curse. Matt, did you ever think we'd see the day that the Flames won in the Honda Center? All I have to say is all hail Jobu, the breaker all of hail. curses. For those that don't know who Jobu is, why don't you explain it? Uh, it's a character from the movie Major Leagues. He's the little voodoo doll that one of the characters had in his locker. And he brought him good fortune as long as nobody touched his rum. And the Flames decided that in order to break the curse, they needed Jobu. And they had him in the locker room before yesterday's game. And the Flames were successful. Somebody actually brought a Jobu doll, and there's pictures on the Flames website. They actually created a stall with Jobu's name on it for the Calgary Flames. Yes. I guess my question is, why did it take so long? If that's all it took, we should have brought Jobu with us years ago. Well, nobody was creative, I don't think. <laughs> Enough to go to the extent of getting a voodoo doll to help break the curse. So Matt, we talked last week about the keys to success for the Flames this year, and we both said winning at the Honda Center is one of those keys. And wasn't that just an awesome feeling? I know I was watching the game, and it was 0-0, and eventually the Flames get up by one, and you're like, holy cow, there's enough time left in this game. They might actually be able to just hold this, uh, you know, hold this lead, and then they get the second one, and I'm looking at the clock going, wow, we may actually have this. Well, I was actually starting to get convinced a little bit it, right off the bat when the the Ducks had a lot of early pressure in the game and they didn't score. Every other time, basically, since 2004, they would have scored during that stretch. And I thought maybe, just maybe, the Flames might be able to eke out a win. Mind you, I think that every time just unfortunately having the dream crushed at some point from some weird fluky bounce but thankfully that didn't come yesterday and it's finally finally over so we never have to talk about it ever again it's now a thing of history it's over it's done we'll be back in the Honda Center on December 29th as the Anaheim Ducks host us again and let's see if we can win that one and close out the season series with two wins there let's not start on that one, another streak of losing at the Honda Center. Though I can actually see that happening. Yeah. Well, we'll see. So that was the third of three games in the Flames' opening week of the season. They started the season on the road in Edmonton on Wednesday, dropping a 3 nothing game to the Oilers. Then they came back to Calgary for the home opener and won 6-3 to three over Winnipeg. And the game we just talked about, a 2 nothing loss to Anaheim, which now puts the Flames at four points in the Western Conference, tied for third with Vegas and Colorado of all teams. So, you know, we're not in the best company, but hey, at least we're having a successful week. And Matt, you were kind of mentioning it before we got started. This should have been a week that was bad for the Flames, historically. Yeah, well, uh, if you look at the Flames, we all, uh, for recent history, pretty much since the year 2000, the Flames have struggled out of the gates early and uh, of the last 16 home openers including the game against Edmonton they only have one victory out of that entire group uh, in the last 15 home openers that prior to the victory over the Jets they had only won one of those and of course Anaheim dropping 25 in a row there so if things had gone according to a lot of recent history the Flames should have started the year 0-3 so the fact that they were able to snap two of those deficiencies is a good thing and hopefully they can get that ball rolling yeah and I mean not just you know winning and maybe winning by fluke but I think that the the games we're seeing of them have been solid games too I mean I was at the home opener on Saturday and the Flames let themselves 
maybe get outplayed a little bit, but it was great perseverance. As soon as they were down three three nothing, I remember looking at my friends saying, "This is going to be a long night," you know, as they got one and then two, and the Flames started coming back, and um, you know, ended up winning six three. And I think it was a great exercise in perseverance. And I think we see the same thing in Anaheim. They didn't get cocky. They didn't do what we've seen sometimes in these games where they get down by a couple and just shut down. I think in all three of them, the Flames played. Pretty much 60 minutes of hockey, would you agree? Well, not so much in the Edmonton game. They Everybody seemed to be a little bit not so good. And not a lot of cohesion in any of the lines. But that happens. And like that was more of a typical game for the start of the season for the Flames. Usually, That it one takes, still felt like a preseason game. Yeah, it, they're still getting their stuff together, and unfortunately, they didn't realize that that was a game that actually mattered. But it happens, and unfortunately, or fortunately, it was just the one. And they were able to bounce back and get four more points out of the three games. And at least... Like especially with how badly the Flames have started the season in recent years, even just being 500 through the first 10 games, I think for a lot of fans would be an achievement. <laughs> so yeah, well, and that's an interesting point too. I mean, I look at this team, and every year I expect that October is kind of a wash. Like this is a team that often just has terrible starts for some reason. Yeah, and at least this year, like the quality of the opponents that they'll be facing is not anywhere near as bad as it was last year where it was basically not only were the flames struggling but it was like elite team elite team elite team elite team (laughs) every night right through the middle of november and like that's why the flames got so far behind the eight ball then and now if the flames can go on that roll and actually win a good portion of the remaining games through the first 10 that will help down the road uh, where they won't need a seven game winning streak to bail themselves out of their season yeah and it gets them in that habit too of just you know i think playing winning hockey i think sometimes when you get in that mentality that we can't win a game we can't win a game we can't win a game it becomes harder to motivate to win those games yeah and the flames are in a different spot in their cycle right now and for the first time since the early 90s the flames are a legitimate contending team and you have to have a little bit of that cocky confidence that uh, it doesn't matter what the other team's doing we're still skating away with the two points and they didn't have that in the first game but they did in the second and especially in the game against anaheim like it, it it was weird. Even though they gave up 43 shots, I, they didn't seem uncoordinated like they usually do in Anaheim. And, uh, like, there was no overwhelming periods of sloppiness where you're going, okay, a goal's coming at any time. There it is. <laughs> you know. And- no, I, you're, you're totally right there. And I think even if you look at the way the Flames played in the playoffs against Anaheim, I'm looking at this going, wow, if we can play this way in one, we could actually take this team in the playoffs this year. Oh, yeah. And uh, granted, Anaheim's a little beaten up, and like we didn't get their full lineup and all that. But. Shh, don't wreck it. But having the confidence that, yes, we can win in Anaheim, that will. Just that psychological breaking of the wheel that. Like, it's not in the back of your head anymore. That, oh, we can't win here. And, like, last year in Game 1 and 2, it looked like they, the Flames, even though they were out playing the Ducks, were just waiting for something to screw up. And then it did, and then they just stopped playing. The wheels come right off at that point. Yeah, and it was, in each game, I thought they were the better team up until the thing screwed up, whatever it was. And then they lost and they just couldn't get back on the horse and now that that whole thing is out of their head say a weird like they do play anaheim in the playoffs and a weird thing happens it's not the end of the world now because 
like, okay, we can win here. It's just a weird bounce happened, and who cares? Yeah, for sure. And it's, like you said, it gets the monkey off their back, and I think it's kind of fitting, too, that not only did they win, but our new goaltender, Mike Smith, got his 34th NHL shutout. Like, I think it's awesome that we didn't. It's not like we barely scraped by. They got the shutout win, and that's even more of a convincing. And Smith set a team record for most saves in a shutout, too. I wouldn't be surprised. He yeah. saw a lot of rubber. Yeah. But we've he beat talked about uh, it Reggie Lemelin and Mika Kiprasov, who both had 40 save shutouts in their Flames career. And it's not a overall franchise record. That belongs to Dan Bouchard, who uh, had a 47 and a 45 save performance for Atlanta. But for Calgary, it is. And we've talked about this before. I mean, Smith gets a lot of rubber. That's what he's used to in, yeah. you know, in Arizona. And so when he is getting 40, you know, 45, 50 shots in a game, we know this guy. We don't want that to happen all the time, but we know that he knows how to handle that. Yeah. And especially Smith, he seems to be the type of goalie that gets a little bored a bit. Because he's so fidgety. Like, he's always out of the crease getting the puck and passing and that. And so, like, I think that him facing a lot of shots may actually be better for him, which doesn't make a lot of sense, because you'd think that, you know, not facing 40 shots would be a good thing, but, you know, he does seem to play better when he's more actively involved. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be getting 40 no, shots a game. No, neither do I. No. You know, 50, 60 shots, but... Or 50, 60 games. But, yeah, it's like, okay, this guy can do it once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Like, if the situation happens where a team does put up that many shots, you know that he's not going to wilt under pressure. So, Matt, let's talk a little bit about Mike Smith. Um, coming into the season, a lot of fans had some doubts on Smith. He's too old. He's not the right guy. They should have brought in somebody different. They should have brought in Gillies as the starter. Three games into what we're seeing with Mike Smith – What's your early assessment of number 41 as our starting goalie? He is meeting my expectations based off of what I saw with them in Arizona. Uh, he's a very good goaltender. He just was playing in front of a really bad Coyotes team. And like it, it's sort of like a Ginla when, uh, it, during the Young Guns era, like after they traded Flurry, like he was the only guy on the team, <laughs> really, that was any good. So uh, he, you can't do everything yourself. And that's why the Flames were terrible then, and that's why the Coyotes have been terrible for a number of years, because one guy can't will the team to win. And Smith is good, and now that he's got a good team in front of him, it takes a lot of pressure off. I thought that Smith was really the only Flame that looked any good in the Edmonton game. Oh, for sure. You know, we can't, we can't, and we can't fault those three goals to the goalie. I think you would have saw a repeat of the first game from last season where Edmonton put up seven. Yeah, and we can't fault those three goals to the goaltender. Well, he only gave up two in the empty netter, so, you know, it, the one was just a defensive lapse that you left McDavid alone and then a breakaway where they left McDavid alone. Well, gee, you know... <laughs> I thought Smith looked adequate in the home opener. He didn't, you know, he didn't steal the game for the Flames, but I thought that he kept them in the game, which which you need your goalie to do. Yeah. Well, like I think after the Jets went up 3-1, I thought he shut the door and made sure that like it didn't become 4 or 5. And I think that helped the Flames get their stuff together so that way they could mount that comeback. Yeah, you're right. He, he realized, okay, this is, you know, as the Flames, let's say, it's go time, right? I can't let another one in. We've got to mount this comeback. And Smith clamped down and went into beast mode and ended up making sure that not another puck went in. And that takes a veteran to be able to do that. Well, you see, the secret sauce there was having Yarmir Yager meet up with the traveling Yagers because since then, the Flames have scored seven goals and the opposition have scored zero. So you're saying that the Flames should bring the traveling Yagers to every game, home or away? Sure, why not? So Matt, the traveling Yagers are a bunch of guys that live in Calgary. So if they're at a Flames game, are they traveling Yagers? N no, now they're the stay-at-home Yagers. <laughs> the domestic Yagers. Yes. Um, but that was a pretty cool scene. Yep. Seeing uh Yager with the traveling Yagers. 
So, you know, my thoughts on Mike Smith so far, I think that he's proved to be better than I think we expect him to be. I think when we made this move, a lot of fans said Smith is old. And he is. I mean, you know, he's an older goaltender, but I don't think we're looking at this to be the franchise goalie. I think this is the goalie who gets us to the franchise goalie, and every organization goes through at least one of those guys. Well, that's the thing. Like, right now, we have two really good goalie prospects in John Gillies and Tyler Parsons. The problem is is that Gillies has had one full pro season, and Parsons just turned pro. And just got assigned to the ECHL. Yeah, like those guys still could use another year or two, uh, Parsons probably two or three, just to get to the point where, okay, you're ready to play in the NHL. And then it's going to be another year or two before they figure out whether or not they're starter or high-end starter material. So you need a stopgap. And Mike Smith has played well thus far and should probably play well the rest of the season and next year. That's it. I think if we look at it for what it is, he's not the franchise goalie. He's not the guy that's going to be here for 5, 10, 15 years. He's going to be here for, I mean, he's got a two-year deal this year, next year. I could see him signing maybe one more after that. But, you know, I mean, this is a guy who's, as you said, you know, making way for the next kid when they're ready. And this allows us to not have to rush either Gillies or Parsons because we have a guy who's adequate. Yeah. Exactly, and that's why they I brought... I think the backup will change next year. But... Yeah, I would expect Gillies to be the backup full-time next year, and then probably Gillies and Parsons the year after with Smith. I think it's going to depend uh, how yeah. Gillies looks. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. And I think there's something to be said for keeping Smith on for a year, even if he's the backup, just as that veteran mentor for Gillies. I mean, even if he could re-sign him for $4 million or three nine. Yeah. For sure. You know, I think that there's something to be said of having a veteran and a kid instead of having two kids. But, yeah, I think Mike Smith's performance so far for me has been the fun thing to watch. He's the one guy who I think for a lot of people has been surprising in what he's doing. But to me, when I see Mike Smith and I see him compared to what we've seen from goalies in the past, I look at this team and go, okay, like you said earlier, they're in contender mode. This team might have the goaltending piece we need to be contenders. I think the last couple of years, last year especially, the biggest fault was the goalies. Yeah. A lot of times the skaters were doing their jobs and the goaltenders weren't. And I'm looking this year going, okay, now we have the goaltender that I think, if anything, isn't going to hinder us. He might not get us into the playoffs on his back, but he's going to you know, get us to where we need to be. Yeah, and like if you look at the playoffs last year, in the four games, Elliott surrendered seven goals that realistically he should have stopped well that happened all all through the year oh i know but that's like two goals a game well all the games were one goal games so that's each game like the flames could have swept the ducks had elliot played adequately so you know it at least smith has performed adequately thus far and he has a track record of performing well and whereas Elliot stats wise was good and you could see that he was being sheltered by the St. Louis Blues unfortunately but it is what it is really curious to see how Elliot looks in Philadelphia this year oh he's already let in a couple of iffy goals so I know but, you know, it's early in the season, too. Yeah. Well, I hope he has a good season, just because, you know, you always like to see people do well. But, yeah, it is what it is. So, Matt, before we move on, um, another topic while we're thinking about the past week is looking at that home opener. And an interesting surprise to me in that one was the man who was named third star, Curtis Lazar. I thought that's probably the best game we've seen from Lazar in a flaming sea. Last year, Lazar wasn't in the lineup much. He was kind of hurt. He had his mono. He was recovering from that. But do you think that we're seeing Curtis Lazar really showing that he's made the top 12 forwards on this team? I think so. That, that, that's the tough problem, though, is the Flames could easily roll five lines, and they can only ice four. And, like, honestly, 
I don't know what to do with Lazar, because he's good enough that he should be able to play, but uh, who do you take out? You know what I mean? Like it's just... Well, there's the thing. We, we're, I mean, we've got Tanner Glass in the lineup. I think Glass comes out of the lineup for Yager, and I think I'd leave Lazar in for a little bit, because what else do you do? You put Freddie Hamilton in? No, I think that Lazar gets taken out for Yager, and you leave the third, fourth line being Glass, Stajan, and Brower. It's an expensive fourth line. Yeah, well, not much you can do about that. The other thing we saw in the home opener was that Glenn Gullitson made some changes to his lineup after the first period. After the Flames finally woke up about 28 minutes into the game, we saw those lines really ignite there. And you and I have had the debate in the past about is the Johnny Monty line the right one? And I think that what we're going to see is more of those guys being separated, at least in the early part of the season here. I think there's some really interesting chemistry evolving with Johnny Goudreau and Sam Bennett. Well, that's the thing. When you have six high-end forwards that are not a part of the 3M line, because that you keep together... But the, all the other six players between Versteeg, Bennett, Yager, Gaudreau, Monaghan, Furland, you can put any combination of those six players with each other and it'll work. So it's mostly what the coaching staff will have to do is base it on how it feels in the game. Like you can start with Gaudreau, Monaghan, and Furland. And it might not be working that game. And instead you stick him with Bennett and Yager, say. And, you know, you can switch things up. And that's one of the good things about our particular lineup is that we have the flexibility where you're not putting an inferior player in a spot where they're not able to perform. You've got enough depth of high quality players that you can really shuffle the deck and get a good grouping no matter which way you do it. I mean, if you look at our third line, which once Yermer Yager debuts will probably be Versteeg, Bennett, Yager, there's a lot of teams that would kill to have that as their second or even first line. Yeah, for sure. And that's part of the reason why the Flames are legitimately a contender because they have an insane amount of depth, which is not normal frankly and especially in the cap era it's difficult to accumulate that much talent throughout the lineup especially on the defense as well and calgary just has that benefit right now of having that flexibility where they can literally shift anybody anywhere and it'll work uh, just depending on the chemistry from game to game and then if injuries happen the flames have no matter what position they have legitimate quality players that can come and step in as well so it's just a weird spot to be in as a flames fan because i think even outside of shuffling the lines it gives us that chance to say okay let's say the goudreau monahan furlan line isn't looking good but the versteeg bennett yager is you can just even tweak the minutes like in the past it was one of those you know we didn't have a deep enough lineup to give anybody else top minutes but looking at our top nine, I think you could really shuffle the minutes any way you want to among those three lines. Oh, for sure. Like, if Bennett have, and Yager are having a great game, you could have them playing 18, 20 minutes and shuffle Goudreau down to, like, 14 if he's not having a good game. Why not? Yeah, or or even, you know, kind of if, you, if you're worried about late in the game, you could give... The Versteeg Benahan, Bennett Yager line a lot more minutes early, and then the Goudreau Monahan Furland late. Like it just it opens so many coaching possibilities that I think it's going to be really interesting to see how Glenn Gullitson and his staff manage those top nine. Mm-hmm. But you know there are some what I thought were lineup anomalies, especially when the Flames made their home opener um, debut of this team for the year. I was surprised to see Bartkowski in the lineup for that game over Kulak. How about you? I'm not really surprised by anything at the moment, just due to the fact that none of the players that are number six, number seven, or the prospects have looked particularly great. Like, Rasmus Anderson was the best of the group, 
but unfortunately he shoots the wrong way for the spot that was open and like if he was a left shot I think he's the number six right now but has there ever been an ambidextrous shot in the NHL a guy can shoot either Gordie way Gordie Howe was the most Bes- prolific besides, one besides yeah besides Howe I can't think of anybody yeah well that's back when the sticks were flat and you could do things like that without needing a different stick yeah, that'd be that'd make you quite a probably a commodity in the NHL today. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I was surprised. I just, yeah, like I, guess I, I was could surprised see that Bartkowski opened the season for the home opener because I thought, okay, even though Kulak hasn't looked good, let's give him that shot to show that he's the right guy. And I thought, you know, especially on the home opener, how can you fight your way back in that spot if you're not being given the chance? I didn't think he looked terrible where he should have not been given the number six but i thought it was kind of bartkowski's to earn well that's where the coaching staff like they're familiar like gullitson is familiar with bartkowski because he had him in vancouver before coming to calgary and kulak hasn't shown th- that he's doing anything differently from bartkowski so i think it's just a matter of going with what you know over who gets an opportunity that's and, true. We see that all the time in the NHL. And like it, yeah, it's not necessarily fair to Kulak, but Kulak kind of played himself out of a position. So, like where you're giving the coach the option, where if Kulak was playing better, then there wouldn't be an option because you know you're obviously going with the better player. And right now they're about equal, so the coaching staff's going with the guy he knows. Yeah, you're probably right. It's that familiarity, right? And we see that all over the NHL. I mean, GMs come in, they bring in their coaches, the coaches bring in their guys. How often do you Mike go, Smith. oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at the front office here, you know, I mean, Treliving used to work for Maloney. Now it looks like Maloney works for Treliving. They brought in Stone, they brought in Smith. You know, they're bringing in the guys they're familiar with. And how often do you see a coach hired and you go, okay, we know these four or five guys are going to make their way to that team. Well, like we saw in L.A., we saw Regeer and Aginla play there. So, yep. you know, what do you expect? Um, the other one that was surprising to some people in the lineup was to see at the home opener that now wearing number 15, he wore 51 during training camp, but number 15, Tanner Glass in the lineup for the home opener. Matt, That's what were your thoughts? That's elite sniper this? Tanner Glass to you. Is that how I have to announce him now? Yes. That's right, what he is known as, is elite sniper Tanner Glass. Uh, Glass is what he is. He's a 12th, 13th forward. He'll hit a bit, and that's about it. And he'll get into a fight like he did in the first game, and he kicked the guy's butt. And that's about it. Like you're not. I guess I was just surprised that he got the start in the home opener because he is, to me, that extra forward. Well, that's the thing. Uh, the Flames have been playing mostly, well, all three of the teams have been bigger teams with some physical guys in the lineup. So they, those would have been the type of games that he would play in naturally anyway. It's just, I think, more coincidental that it coincided that those teams were who we were playing first. Like, if we were playing three. Vancouver, I don't think that Glass necessarily plays. But yeah, you could be right there. We'll see. Like um, I'm not, ex- I'm not really expecting him to play like 60 games or anything like that. But he hasn't played bad, so. Well, you were actually mentioned in the last game, the Anaheim game, that you were really impressed by Tanner Class. Yeah, he did some decent moves, in, and he cycled the puck effectively. And the fourth line had a couple of very good shifts, doing a decent part to Tanner Glass's efforts and you know that's all you can ask from him not to be a liability out there and he wasn't and he brought some physicality to the game I had nothing wrong with him playing in that one for sure five out of five wood dress again pretty much yeah so, yeah, and I mean, for what he is, like you said, as long as he's not a liability, that's the important part. We've seen a lot of teams with their enforcers who are a liability when they're, when they're on the ice. And I think compared to some of the enforcers the Flames have had in the last handful of seasons, I think Glass is the best hockey player of all of them. Pretty much, yeah. 
Like, he, you can feel comfortable when he's out there that he's not going to do something extremely stupid. <laughs> And if you look, it's generally the enforcer that becomes the fan favorite. I mean, Furland played that role in his first year. McGratton's played that role. Going all the way back to guys like Sandy McCarthy. You know, these are often the guys the fans end up falling in love with and almost become attached to. So it'll be curious to see if we start seeing number 15 glass jerseys around uh, the Saddle Dome. If people still have money to buy one after they buy their Yager jersey. Yeah, well, I think the presses are still going on the Yagers. You know, I was at the home opener, and all you saw in Fanatic was Yager jerseys. Well, why they not? They couldn't make them fast enough. Oh, no, of course not. Well, how often does that happen? Like, give me a break. Yager got the biggest applause of the night, and he wasn't even playing. The second biggest went to George Canyon. So if you were if you were looking at Tanner Glass and Mart, Matt Bartkowski, predictions on how many games each of these guys play in the lineup? Uh, for Bartkowski, I'd say probably... 40 to 50 and glass probably in that neighborhood as well really yeah okay yeah i think you're being generous i think you'll probably see bartkowski play 25 games i think you'll probably see glass play let's say 30 um i just think that kulak has to step up and take bartkowski's job i think his future of the in this organization depends on it i agree there and, and I, I think, think that, like, like I just don't see Kulak doing enough to take the spot. So, if that's the case, then I think what'll happen is that the Flames will ride with Bartkowski for the majority of the season and then add somebody at the trade deadline. Like, just some quality number six guy. And see, even in that case, if I was the GM, I think I'd be more likely to say, Hey, Kulak's not cutting it. Let's bring somebody up from the A and give them a try. Well, the only guy that would work is Shillington, and I don't, I'm don't. i not sure he's ready yet either or would be an upgrade on a, either of the other two at the moment. So, I would try Anderson on the wrong hand. So would I, but unfortunately the coaching staff thinks differently. At least right now. I mean, I think there's that, you know, you can't stifle good talent, and I think if Rasmus has a good year, I think they're going to be forced to bring him up. But we'll see. I yeah, think um, yeah, it's such uh, a bad problem to have. Gee, we have too many good prospects. <laughs> well, I, and is it, but it's not the problem that we have too many good prospects. I guess my issue is if Bartkowski's playing forty games this year, what does that say about our prospects? Like to me, somebody in the AHL has to be able to step up, whether it's Kulak or one of the guys in the A, and say, "I can do better than this." I mean, Bartkowski was brought in last year simply for numbers for the expansion draft. He's outlived his usefulness. Yeah, I you know, he, I agree with what you're saying, but it's also developmentally wanting Stockton to have a good team and allow those guys twenty minutes a night instead of like eight up here so like it's one of those things like it's like jankowski he is better than stajan he's better than brower he's better than glass he's better than lazar but do you want him playing eight minutes a night or 20 in stockton and i'd prefer him playing 20 in stockton i could see the team giving tyler watherspoon one more shot in that role I, so could I, and depending on how he does in Stockton. If he has, yeah, a, I think if he, he, looks good, he, he regresses at all, no. But if he has another decent season, then sure, why not? If Kulak's not looking like he can take that job away from Bartkowski, I think that, and I think this might just be motivation for Kulak. We'll see. But if Kulak can't take that job, I wouldn't be surprised if they do try Wotherspoon again. No. Yeah. Like you're and saying, that way earlier, you can it's, cut the, bait. it's the devil they know. Yeah, and that way you can cut bait regardless like if none of them are stepping up to an adequate level you can just cut bait and okay next whether that's valamaki or whomever doesn't matter yeah i mean this is kulak's last year he's making 650 this year and he's an rfa and i honestly believe if he doesn't step in and play let's say 30 40 games this year i don't think that he gets an nhl job with the flames again next year oh they might just do what they did with Wotherspoon and just sign him and throw him in the A. Yeah, I, I can totally see that, but I just think that this is his probably his only chance to 
you know, get that NHL job and prove it's that he that he's earned it. Yeah, well, especially with guys like Fox, Shillington, Anderson, and Valamaki coming up, like it's play play your way or in now or go away. Yeah, that window's closing quickly. Um, so we'll see how how those guys do. I think it's good the Flames have some sort of an enforcer again. We didn't have one last year after Boley got banished to Stockton. And I don't think that Hathaway is necessarily the guy for that. I like that they're bringing in more of a veteran guy there, but I would rather see Glass than Gadzik. True. When the Flames signed Gadzik, I thought, really? I really hope this guy never wears a flaming C. Yeah. Also, uh, one little bit of note, uh, one of the Flames prospects, Zach Fisher, uh, who was reassigned to the Medicine Hat Tigers, is no longer playing for them and is likely going to be going to either Stockton or to Kansas City. So he was uh, the Flames' fifth-round draft pick last year, and he's going to be reassigned. Yeah, I'm. I don't know about Fisher. I'm trying. I was looking at him. I was trying to figure out. I don't know him all that well, but just looking at his stats and looking at some video, I'm trying to figure out where they have room for this kid. And I honestly think this is probably an ECHL signing. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if that's where he goes for right now. He's a right winger. I don't know how much right wing space they have. For those that don't know him, he's a 20 year old, so he's overage. He can go up there. Uh, six foot one, 196 pounds. I just I'm looking going is he better than the current right wingers either on an AHL or an NHL deal and I think he'll probably start the year in uh, in Kansas City and that's not the worst place for him like even a guy like Furlan started down in the E so it's not a big deal well sometimes you you build a guy up there and go look you got you know 60 game 60 goals like Falkowski right he he looked great down there and then it's okay now show us you can do this at the a level or, and then the nhl level and there's a lot of guys that start in the e and i don't think that's a bad place for fisher i think he'll benefit from playing pro in either league yep probably more than he will being an overager in the uh, whl yeah especially when the coach is giving preferential ice time to his son which is a little strange that never happens man what are you talking about yeah a little strange Anyway. This is professional sports. We always play the best players. Yes. That's why Brower's still on the team. Yes. Sure. Speaking of Brower, before we move on, what have you thought of him in the first three games? <sighs> in the first the game... Besides all you need. We'll just stop there. Yeah. The first game, he was legitimately terrible. and But there's a lot of guys that were. Yeah. And it... Like, I think I even said on Calgary Puck, like, if he's trying not to get hurt in case he gets traded, then maybe that would make sense. Um, his play has picked up a bit in the last two games. I, yeah, he, he's got a ways to go. Uh, that one brilliant pass that he made on the penalty kill the other day, yesterday, when, uh, he passed it right to the duck player, wide open, right in front of the net. That was a beautiful pass there. So, uh, you know, some really boneheaded mistakes still, but, uh, yeah. Um, to me, to me, I think Browers played like a fourth liner. When I watch him play, I really tried to isolate him in the home opener when I was there. He looks like a guy who's on the fourth line. Yeah, and I agree. I think this is... I think this is going to be one of those things where Brower has to earn his way up the lineup, and I think this is also probably being said to the guys in Stockton, this is the guy to beat. Yeah. So I think there's probably a lot of pressure on Brower from both sides. If you got to earn your way to stay in this lineup, or Freddie Hamilton or someone else will come in, but also, you know what, look at how deep our top nine are. You think you're part of that? Well, play better than Versteeg or Yager or Furland. Yeah, and you also have to look, the, the Flames, like if – this is how Brower plays. Like they're not going to be able to get rid of him, frankly, because just the amount of dollars left. And the one good thing is that the Flames, other than Backland, have no contracts coming off at the end of the season. And uh, well, they do, but maybe not ones they want to bring back. Yeah, like nobody of note where the guy's going to get like a four million dollar raise or anything like that. Stajan comes off. I don't think he comes back. Versteeg comes off the books. He'll be back, but that's a cheap contract. Yeah, Yager might come back. 
so you know it, it there like there's nothing drastic like you're not gonna st see Versti going from like two million up to like six million or something like that like say if Kachuk's contract ended you'd see him get quite the bump so it's not a big deal for next year but like if the flame like if Brower does continue to struggle then I could see the flames not at the end of this season but at the end of the next one buy him out like they did with Lance Boma because they'd save three million dollars on the final year of the contract which that's when it becomes important to shed some dollars for sure. For those that have forgotten, Troy Brower is 32 years old. He has three years left on his contract, $4.5 million against the cap each year with a full no trade clause. So even if we wanted to move him, he'd have to okay that. But as a guy playing on the fourth line, I think if anyone wants you, you go. Yeah. Um, I can maybe see there being some value for Brower at the deadline next year. I don't think anyone wants him this year. It's just too big a contract. The only way, though, whether the deadline next year or if they can find a buyer somehow this year, we're going to have to eat half of that salary. Like, nobody's going to take him at 4 5. And that's okay. I'd rather eat half the salary than buy him out and have the cap hit for double the length. Well, realistically, if you, after next season, if you buy him out, then it's only a $1.5 million cap hit for two seasons. So it's, After next year, you could. I wouldn't do it this no, year. No, no, not at all. You that that's what I was meaning with like there's no real important contracts ending this year, so like we can afford to have Brower next year. Like it won't it'll not be great, but you can get by. Do you, do you think that coaches or management or whoever's making the decision will put him in the lineup more often than not simply because of what they're paying him, or do you think that this? coaching team is ready to say you know what someone else has outplayed you be it Lazar be it um, Hamilton be it one of the kids in the farm we're going to pay you 4.5 million to go sit in the press box and eat popcorn if say Jankowski and Spencer Fu just for argument are ripping it up in Stockton they have like more than a point per game each and are just like ready for the NHL I could see them both getting benched. I I'm not Brower and Furland. Uh, Brower and or Stajan. sorry, Brower and Stajan. Yeah. So if somebody forces their way in, you make room. It's just that you're gonna give the guy every opportunity to turn it around, in hopes that you know because Brower has a long track record of being a good player. So maybe just having a bad start just like he was having a bad period after his hand injury. And if that's the case, then you're getting a legitimate top six, top nine forward who also will be playing on your fourth line, but that level of player on your fourth line. So we'll just have to see. And it's three games in and a long way to go. Yeah, I think Brower probably, too, has that mental piece going. I mean, it's hard to play in a Canadian market. He probably knows everyone's, everyone in the media, all the fans are against him, and that's hard to bounce back from. So I was honestly surprised he came into this season still wearing an A. I thought that might have been taken away from him. But obviously there's, you know, he's still that leader. If nothing else, will keep him around for that piece. And I'm... I'm hoping this turns around. I mean, so do I. Lo looking back, Froelich had a tough first season here too. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm hoping for: is that just having a bad year last year and can put it behind them and have a good one this year. Through three games, not so much, but we'll see. We still got lots of hockey to play. No. I don't think Brower ever makes it to his potential of being the right winger for Goudreau Monahan. No. I, I honestly two. think that, like, if Goudreau and Monaghan are getting a full-time replacement from Furland, it'll be Yager, and then you could put Brower on the third line with Versteeg and Bennett, possibly, if Furland disappoints that much. And I think with Brower being, you know, sort of the odd man out, if you will, we talked about Lazar earlier. I think you're going to see Brower and Lazar kind of swapping places there on that fourth line. Possibly. But we'll see. I mean, that's, as we talked about last week, that'll be one of the storylines. Can Brower bounce back this season? 
Well, Matt, last week we asked a question of the fans. We were all high on number 68 finally coming to Calgary. He still hasn't played a game yet, but we want everyone's thoughts on this. And we did our poll of the week, which is on the website, on Facebook, and on Twitter. And we asked, what are your thoughts on the Yager signing? 61% of respondents said they realized he's a great depth signing for the team. And that was the number one answer. We had 11 percent of people say they were neutral we'll see how this pans out it could go either way and 16 percent asked well for signing old veterans why yager over iggy's there's still that desire to see iggy here in town well you never know you know if the flames are doing great at the trade deadline after the olympics maybe again less signs on as the fourth line right winger can you imagine being one of the kids in stockton playing well and you go i lost my job to yager and again <laughs> well Stranger I things. might as well sign a 20-year deal with this team. And by the time I'm 45, I too can make the lineup. Yeah, well, stranger things, you know. I can see Jerome doing what they did with Regeer and sign a one-year deal here at some point and then just retiring. Yeah. I hate that, but that's what I see happening. Yeah, one-day deal, yeah. And I think it'll be after the Olympics. I still think this guy is going to be our captain at the Olympics. Same here. I think, he, and plus it also helps him so he doesn't have to play in a t place like Colorado, and he can just go directly to whichever contender suits him the best. And by then, like it'll be after like February, so he'll be able to determine which team's doing the best and like who's the most likely to win the cup and if he wants to win one go sign with whomever that is i'll be curious to see what kind of shape he's in in february yeah i mean we're even seeing yager come in and not being able to play right away because he's not in game shape yeah well i'm sure that you might see a Ginla in the spengler cup possibly or some any other game action that he can get into without playing overseas do they still have that like touring NHL All Star team? I remember they used to come to Calgary and play the cops. I could see them doing something like that. Yeah, possibly. Who knows? That's kind of for over the hill guys, but at this point, maybe Aginlan's over the hill. Well, Matt, we got a new poll of the week this week, and we're gonna ask fans with the Flames win in Anaheim. How do you feel about the season now? Have your thoughts changed about the season? Do you think, wow, if we can win the Honda Center, we should start planning the Stanley Cup parade route now? Or are you thinking, you know what, the Ducks didn't have a full lineup, it's not a win worth getting excited over, or maybe something in between. So we want to hear what you guys think. You can vote by going to firesidechat.ca. You can go to our Twitter account, twitter.com slash firesidepodcast, or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash firesidechat, and vote for the one you think, and we'll go through the results next week on the show. I think this is going to be an interesting one to see, you know, a day, two days, three days after that win, how people actually feel about it. I think we were all elated last night. It was something I gave thanks for on Thanksgiving, but I'm going to be curious to see what the fan base thinks now that it's over and it's done with, and we can look back objectively on the game. Not only that, we've also got another week of Flames hockey coming up here. Uh, the Calgary Flames have two games. They'll play, or three games. They have the LA Kings on the road on Wednesday the 11th. Then they play host to the Ottawa Senators on Friday. And on Saturday, they're on the road again playing against Vancouver. Looking at this road trip, I think that we can do two of three wins here. What are you thinking, Matt? Well, LA's not as good, but they're still dangerous. So if the Flames take them lightly, they they could lose but if they treat it seriously they should be able to come away with two points ottawa they went to the conference finals last year this is the hardest test besides edmonton thus far so i'm hoping that they have a good game and vancouver they should walk all over so i'm hoping for six points and that's what i'll go with so six points for the week yep I'm going to go with four. I think that the team will drop one of the back-to-back, -back, either Ottawa or Vancouver, just because, I mean, how often has this team won two back-to-back? -back? I do think we see our uh, first game for Eddie Lack during the during the regular season in one of those games, I probably would, Vancouver. Yeah, I would. Why not? You know, let him have revenge against his old team. And, you know, L.A., I think... We always play good hockey against L.A., and I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames drop it, but by a narrow margin. Yeah. Oh, and that, that could be a great learning piece. Yeah, that's going to be the one of the main tests of the week because LA is kind of one of those quasi playoff-ish teams. So 
you know, we're not really sure what LA is right at this point, so, you know, especially with them being so banged up last year, where it was just basically Jeff Carter and that's it. Um, we'll see. I'm, I don't think they make the playoffs this year, but, you know, it'll be a tough game regardless. So, Matt, we're still on the Yager watch. Yermer Yager signed with the Calgary Flames three games in. He has yet to make his debut with this team. Um, do you think we'll see him on the ice this week? Well, I think Ottawa, uh, if he's going to get in, it'll probably be Ottawa. You won't debut him on the road. No. Home fans want to see that. You can sell tickets to that. Yeah, exactly. And if not, then it'll be like the, the game after Vancouver. So the way I look at this is we play Ottawa on the 13th, Vancouver on the 14th, then the Flames have a four-day break. They don't play the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th. I think there's some marketing aspect to this too. Ottawa and Carolina aren't going to sell tickets. Those are going to be tough games to sell. I think either one of those putting Yager in, you immediately sell a whole bunch of tickets. Knowing that Yager's not up to game speed, I see him waiting until the 19th on the Thursday after having you know this week and pretty much all of next week to to get up to game speed and i think you'll see him debut against carolina could very well be but i'd be shocked if it's on the road i mean we would pretty much need a big injury where you're forcing them in the lineup um and there's what three home games here in the next week and a half so i i think you'll see him soon but it's going to be a dome debut i'm calling that right now yeah and, like, there's no rush. It's not like the Flames were playing terribly, so, you know. No, and that's the nice thing, right, is you can get him in. I mean, for a million bucks, it's not like for every game he sits, you're paying him a crap ton of money. The Flames are playing well. We don't need him in there yet, so let him let him get his legs under him. Let him feel ready. Yeah, and, you know, even when he does play, like, don't expect him to be a world beater right off the bat. It'll take a while, so... Well, we mentioned that last week. This is not the the answer to the first line right wing position. Yager's not forty five. He's slowing and down. Not yet, at least. Like it, it, Yager, like even last year and the year before, it took him like until December to be like in top game shape. But then after that, he was great. So it's I wouldn't expect him to be like he'll do all right, but he won't be at him his level until probably the 30 40 game mark of the season see i don't see him getting any significant time on a goudreau monahan furlan line but where i can see him being used if they finally split up goudreau monahan now i can see him jumping in with one of those two and i'd stick him with monahan because monahan's not very quick in his own right so yeah i think a goudreau bennett um furland would be okay and then like a Versti, Versti, yeah monahan yager yeah, because none of those players are those particularly people. fast, but they're all more cerebral, so it's more like having the Sedins together type of feel to it, where it's well, just puck and, and control I, and like probing the defense to find that opening to score. And I think it also gives both of our top two offensive weapons a genuine setup man. I think, you know, with Goudreau, you give him Bennett. With Monaghan, you give him Yager. Yep. I agree. And and right now the two snipers are setting each other up, and you know I think you 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 could see them both get a massive amount more points if they have a dedicated setup man. Yep. Well, Matt, enjoy the next week of Flames hockey. Let's hope that they play as well in the next week, or at least have as good a result in the next three as they did in the first three. Exactly, and I'm just hoping that they continue to have a good October, get a good start to the season, so that way. As the grind begins to happen, they can bank some points and hopefully be one of the top teams in the division and maybe even win the division title. Let's not jinx it. It's only three games in, but it's nice to see them starting off well. Usually I kind of write off this month and it's like, oh, wow, okay, they're coming out of the gate. They're serious contenders here and they're showing everybody. Yep. Thanks for listening, everybody, and have a great week, and we'll be back at it this time next week with another episode of Fireside Chat. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.